Well, hey, good morning. On October 31st, it's a, obviously we know that it's Halloween, but 507 years ago, a man named Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the Wittendorf door. And what he wanted was a conversation to start. What we now look back on 507 years is that is the moment when the Protestant Reformation started, of which our church is part of that stream. And one of his, his major contentions is, was that there was a division of class in a sense. There was the spiritual class and then there was everybody else. There was the priests, there was the bishops, there was the Pope. And they were positionally closer to God than everybody else. And that created a huge division and divide. And Luther thought that biblically faithfulness was, we're all in Christ equal. And so it's kind of a long quote here, but this is important as we look at today, the priesthood of believers. Luther says, it is pure invention that Pope, Bishop, priests, and monks are called the spiritual estate, while princes, lord, artisans, and farmers are called the temporal estate. This is indeed a piece of deceit and hypocrisy, yet no one need be intimidated by it for this reason. All Christians are truly of the spiritual estate. There is no difference among them except that of office. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 that we are all one body, Yet every member has its own work by which it serves the others. This is because we all have one baptism, one gospel, one faith, and are all Christians alike. For baptism, gospel, and faith alone makes us spiritual and a Christian people. And yeah, it's true that not all are pastors, not all are in full-time vocational ministry. That depends on the calling and the gifts of the Spirit. But all believers are, are equal. We're all part of the one body of Christ. And yeah, we're going to hold different offices within. We're going to have different parts to play, so to speak, in the one body of Christ. We are to use whatever gifts that God has given to us to serve that one body. And so if there is still this carryover that only, you know, certain religious workers are the ones that do the work of ministry, well, this is a call this morning to get off the sidelines and to get into the game. That this is, today we're talking about the calling for all of us. That we are all part of this priesthood of believers. So our main point today is that all believers together have a priestly role in the world. And this is actually really God's calling for his whole people. And, and you see this all the way back even into the Old Testament where God speaks of Israel. Yeah, there are individual priests within Israel, but the nation as a whole was to be a kingdom of priests shining the light of God to the nations. Look at Exodus 19, where this is after God has rescued the people of Israel out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He brings them to the foot of Mount Sinai from which he will present to them the world, still the world's greatest summary of ethical teachings there ever will be, the Ten Commandments. But right before he does that, he speaks to them and he tells them who they are. In Exodus 19, 3 through 6, it says, While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for the whole earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And this is a collective identity. This is a collective group here that, 
that God has first delivered them, rescued them out of slavery, out of Egypt, and has brought them to himself. He's first called the people of Israel to himself. That's what makes them a holy nation. They are set apart from all the peoples of the world, but yet they have a vocation. They have a mission to the peoples of the world. And part of that is, is living out the rule of God, living out his wisdom, displaying him essentially to the world. And that's what makes them a kingdom of priests. They are his representatives to the nations. And look how Peter in the New Testament picks up the exact same language and he applies it to this newly formed people of God, which is the church, which is the Jew and the Gentile together united in Christ. He says this in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Do you see the similarities? Those two passages set side by side. Like God, first of all, he's rescued us out of darkness. He's rescued us out of our slavery to sin. He has called us to himself. And then he has a vocation for us. He has a mission for us, which is first to proclaim his excellencies to the world and then to display his rule as we live our lives. We are the light of the world. To shine the light of Jesus wherever we go, we are his representatives. We are his priests together. So our first point today is first the priesthood has access to God. And as a priesthood of believers, we have access to God as all of us, not just the elite. Now, in the Old Testament, there was the priesthood, and we, we looked at this a lot last week, that mediated between God and humanity. And priests were necessary. They mediated because there was a broken relationship, because of human sin. We have sinned and rebelled against God that broke our relationship, and yet God called these special people, these holy people, to mediate that relationship and to actually bring reconciliation and restoration to it by offering sacrifice on behalf of the people to God. And then they then would represent God by, again, declaring favor and forgiveness over the people. And we saw last week that, that Jesus is our great high priest. He's the one that fulfills perfectly that office. And that Jesus himself is also the sacrifice. He didn't just offer, he didn't offer an animal. He offered himself the perfect sacrifice. Jesus being fully God can represent the divine side of things. Fully human represents us. And he restored this broken relationship. And so he's our mediator. And, and therefore in Christ, he gives us access that was once denied. We had to be far from God due to our sin. But because now in Christ, our sin has been dealt with and forgiven, we can draw near to him. And I know we looked at this verse a couple of weeks ago, but again, Ephesians 2.18 says, through Christ, through him, we both, he's talking in this context in Ephesians 2 about Jew and Gentile, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So because of Christ, we are all given access to God. We are no longer strangers. We're no longer aliens. We're no longer far away from him, but have been brought near. And this is, this is not just for a special group of people, the elite within the group. This is talking about all Christians, all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In Ephesians 2, he's not just talking to the pastors. He's not just talking to the spiritual elite within that church. He's talking to the entire church, all those that are believers in Jesus, male, female, children, whoever believes in Christ. And this is because the priesthood, this is not just a bunch of positionally closer to God people, which is why you have to go through them. They still mediate the relationship that you have to God because they are positionally closer. That's not true at all. But in Christ, we all are justified, which means that's the standing we have before God. We are positionally in the same position, which is in Christ, the perfect relationship we have. And so we don't have to, in order to pray to God, we don't have to go through a human priest to mediate our relationship with him. In order to receive forgiveness, we don't have to go through a human priest because they're not in a better positional relationship to God than we are. If we're all in Christ, we all are in the same position. It's Jesus that brings us into the right relationship with God. And so if we're going to pray, we pray through Jesus. We talked about this, praying in his name. If we're going to receive forgiveness, it's through Jesus that we receive forgiveness. Grace comes through Jesus. And that's true for me as it is for any of you. It's not like I have a special, you know, hotline number or something to God. That, you know, when Pastor John, who was our former pastor, retired, you know, he didn't bring me into a back room and gave me like this golden, shiny card that I could call to God. Hey, if you want, if you want me to talk to God, I just, I got the number. You just come talk to me and then I'll talk to God. God wants all of us to draw near to him and draw near in worship. So our point number two is that our priesthood offers spiritual sacrifices in worship. As a priesthood of believers, we all offer sacrifices. And after all, priests, they were involved in the worship of God and and a critical component of the worship of God was the offer of sacrifice. And it was, yes, for sin. A lot of the sacrifice was for sin, but there are other sacrifices given. Sacrifice for thanksgiving. And one of these phrases in the Old Testament that's common associated to the act of sacrifice was that when God, in a sense, looks down on the sacrifice and and it would give off a smell, that this smell would be a pleasing aroma to God, that these sacrifices were a pleasing aroma to God. This is used 16 times in the book of Leviticus, 18 times in the book of Numbers. And we talked about this last week. Jesus is the sacrificial offering for sin. That is complete. That is done. So whatever sacrifice we offer to God, it is not a sacrifice for sin. Jesus is the only one who can make that sacrifice and he did on our behalf. But the New Testament often speaks about how we offer ourselves, how we dedicate ourselves to the service and worship of God. And that is spoken of in sacrificial language. Pastor Tim, he read this right before we prayed. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is the classic example here. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The order of this is extremely crucial. He first says, what are we to do? I mean, this is Romans 12. It's it's within, obviously, the context of the entire letter to the Romans. He's looking at the first, what we call 11 chapters of that letter, and he's saying, by the mercies of God. So now what he's going to be speaking about is our response to what God has already done in Christ. Therefore, read Romans 1 through 11 and see what God has done in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then based on what he has done, what he calls the mercies of God in Christ, what are we to do in response? What are we to do in light of that? But this is so critical that it's first the mercies of God because everything, everything that you and I do should be a response to the mercy and grace of God. 
There is no earning. There is no meriting any of this. This is all in response to what God has first done, what God has already done in Jesus Christ. Worship is a response to a worthy God of love who's already displayed and magnified his grace in Jesus. And he gave everything, right? Jesus sacrificed his entire life for us. And so this is like Jesus is a whole burnt offering, which in the Old Testament, there was obviously there were many different kinds of sacrifices. And one of them was you literally burnt the whole thing because a lot of the other sacrifices, they would only burn a portion of it. But a whole burnt offering was giving the entire thing, total sacrifice. And that's what Jesus gave to us. And then in light of that, this is what Romans 12 is saying, in light of what Jesus has done, our proper response to that, that Jesus has given us everything, is to present our own bodies as a living sacrifice to God, right? Are holy and acceptable to him. And so when we talk about worship, obviously sometimes we, we think of singing because we call it worship music or this is when we worship. But worship is far more than singing. Singing is a part of it. Really what we're looking at here is a whole life lived for God is worship. It's the choices we make. It's how we love. That's how we worship. And so that's why Paul then talks about the fact that we need to renew our minds, this control center, how we make decisions, how we love is all dependent on where we are thinking, how we're going. So living out this will of God. And at the top of the list is love. And again, this is another verse we looked at a couple weeks ago, Ephesians 5.2. He says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Notice here, Christ, yeah, he gave everything, right? That whole burnt offering, but look what it was. How does Paul describe it? It was a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But after all, Ephesians 2, what, 5, 2, what's it saying? It's actually an imperative to us. He first starts with walk in love. He's telling us this is how we are to conduct our lives. We are to live lives of love. And then he uses Christ as the example. See, look who Christ first loved us. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And that's a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Which means that when we walk in love like Christ did, then it's also a fragrant offering a pleasing aroma and sacrifice to God. When we don't seek our own good, but when we seek the good of others, that's a beautiful sacrifice to God. It's a pleasing aroma. When we practice patience and kindness, and when we forgive one another, it's an act of sacrifice that we as a priesthood of believers can offer to our God. Look at Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. It says, Through him, or Christ, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Let us, therefore, in Christ, through him, continually, all the time, not just when we come together on church on Sundays, but to offer up a sacrifice of praise. And again, yeah, that can be through singing. That could just be through saying words. That could be sharing a testimony. That could be saying, thank you, God. All of this, it could be a sacrifice of praise to God. And then verse 16 says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. That giving to others, sacrificing out of your own resources is described as a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. Look how Paul talks about this when he receives generosity in Philippians 4.18. Philippians is like the greatest thank you letter ever written. Paul is writing in prison, thanking this church in Philippi for thinking of him and sending a gift by Epaphroditus. 
to bless him while he's in prison. And this is what he says in Philippians 4.18. He says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. This is how Paul describes this church's generosity to him. We would just say, you might look at it and just say, yeah, they were nice and they gave him some stuff. Look how he sees this. Epaphroditus is the messenger of the church, but he sees this as a fragrant offering, a pleasing aroma, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And this is what we can do when we are generous towards others. The world might just see this as a nice, you know, altruistic sort of thing. But when we're doing it to the glory and worship of God, it is a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to him. And so when we see others in need and we give out of our own resources, that's a fragrant offering. When we support the church and its ministries of discipleship and outreach, including like, here's a real tangible one, the things that, you know, Brittany just talked about the boxes of love, which we go to support our adopt a school program, these, these needy families. When we put these boxes together and we give them to them, that's a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And so though we don't offer sacrifice to atone for sin, that's been done in Jesus Christ, we still in the worship of God as the spiritual priesthood, in a sense, we do offer ourselves. We live a life to the glory of God, a life of love, a life of thanksgiving and praise, a life of generosity. And all of that is a pleasing aroma to God. Our third and final point is that a priesthood has a double representation. Again, as a priesthood of believers, we are representatives of God. And in the Old Testament, we saw this, that the priests have this double function, that they represent people to God and they represent God to people. And we can do the very same thing. We look at representing people to God. We talked about this briefly last week, but intercession, praying for others, intervening on behalf of others to God, representing them. And so we all might organize your prayer list differently, whether you have a prayer list on your phone, you have pen and paper by your bed, you have a Rolodex in your head, you can just remember all these people and all their needs. But here's what's true about our prayer list. This side of heaven, they will always be full. They will be brimming over with things to pray for. We're never going to run out of things to pray for. Not every, you know, it would be impossible that everyone that you know is healthy, knows God, is thriving in relationships. That's never going to happen this side of heaven. We're always going to have our prayer list brimming full. If someone comes off the list because they've been healed, someone is going to come back on the list. But as a priest and a believer, this is what we get to have, this privilege to, to represent people to God, to bring him the hurt, the sick, the dying, the lost, to intercede for others and to pray for them. And, and as we pray, and I know this can be overwhelming, that our prayer list will never empty. This is good for us. This helps form us. Prayer forms us. As much as we're trying to appeal to God, it also does a work in our own lives. It forms us to be a kind of people. And it, and it shapes where our minds are focused on. So if, we're, if you, you know, whether you have a gratitude journal or you, pray, you, know, you wake up and you try to pray for three things you're thankful for, or however you want to do that, right? If you're thinking and you're intentionally looking for to see God's blessings in your life, to see how he has given you something and you have something to be thankful for. If your mind is looking for good, right? Looking to be thankful to God, that shapes us. That forms us to be a kind of person that is actually more joyful because we're looking for to see this amazing God of love and how he has gifted us. You know, whether it's me coming home from work and I can just come home, I could be tired, I could throw my stuff down or whatever, or I walk in 
and I see my two beautiful boys looking up at me. I see my wife who has dedicated the whole day to, to watch these boys and to raise them. And I can sit here and I say, thank you, God. Thank you for your blessings in my life. When we pray for others that are hurt, when we pray for others that are dying, who are sick, that helps us, that forms us to be people of compassion. We might think that our problems are great, and perhaps yours are. But when we think about others, when we think about the things that other people are going through, that helps us actually have compassion for other people. It gifts our eyes off ourselves. And it brings them on people who need prayer too. And we go to the Lord and we intervene for them. And we enter into their suffering. And really what we're doing is we're practicing walking in love as we think about the, ner- the hurts and needs of those around us. And here's one. I hope this is not controversial, but we should pray for whoever wins this upcoming election. And whether you like with every fiber of your body disagree with their worldview, with their governing philosophy, with their character, who whatever you don't like about the person who wins, he or she, may we, as Paul in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, may we offer prayers for them. It says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings or presidents, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet, godly and dignified in every way. And you know what? Our country probably won't see your prayers. The president won't know you, won't know your prayers. But that is the service that we can offer. And that is something that is pleasing to God. And I know, you know, the media cycle is very negative. It's always looking at negative things. And we can get easily drawn into that. Totally, easily. But let us take those, th- those thoughts captive and actually let those things lead us into prayer. Because as Tim said, our, our country needs prayer. There are so many needs around the world. But instead of being overwhelmed with just negativity, we bring them to somebody who's actually the sovereign king of the world. And we lay it before his feet. And that gives us peace and comfort, knowing that all these issues aren't going to be solved by you and me, not going to be solved by the next president of the United States. It's going to be solved by the king of the universe. And finally, we represent God to people. And as Peter said in that 2, 9, and 10, that we declare the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so we have this privilege that we get to speak God's words to a lost, dying, and dark world, and to give them the hope and message of Jesus. And Paul calls us, because we're representatives of God, he calls us ambassadors in 2 Corinthians 5.20. He says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That first, we get to declare that reconciliation is available. It's possible in Jesus Christ and that God actually wants to make his appeal through us. And Paul's talking to the church here. He's not just like through me, through the missionary guy, Paul, the church planter. He's like through all of us. God wants to make his appeal to tell this world to be reconciled to God in Christ. That there is hope in Jesus. There is eternal life in Jesus. And so as Paul says earlier in this letter, that he has given us the ministry, all of us, the ministry of reconciliation, where we as representatives of God get to tell the world that there is hope and salvation in Jesus. And so as Luther is attributed to saying that we are mere beggars telling other beggars where to find food. That's what we are. We are mere beggars telling other beggars, just like us, where to find food. And we find it in Christ. And he wants to use us and work through us. And here's the thing. We all have a testimony. You all have a testimony. You all have a story. And if we were to go around the room and we were to all tell our story, it's all going to be different. 
It's the same grace, but it's a different story. And God wants to actually work through each of our stories, each of your lives, to you to tell how God has has done a marvelous work, how he's brought you out of darkness, whatever that darkness was, sin and whatever things going on in your life, and has brought you in Christ into his marvelous light. We all have a story. We all can share that story. Because here's the thing, not everyone's going to come to a church service. Not everyone's going to listen to a sermon or podcast or read a book. But if they have a relationship with you, they know you. And they'll listen to your story. And we all have different spheres and influences, right? As the church gathers, it scatters. And we scatter to many different places. And as the priesthood of believers, it is this amazing privilege that together and individually, we all work and God works through all of us and wants to make his appeal to implore us, implore through us to be reconciled in Christ. That that's possible, that salvation is in Jesus and he wants us to share that that life, the message of hope, the love of God in Christ to the world. And so this week, look for ways to live that out, to walk in love, to be his representatives wherever he's called you, and to remember that we are a kingdom of priests. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what a privilege it is first to know you, to have a relationship with you. And Lord, we we recognize that it is by the mercy of God, that it is by the, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we are saved, we are brought into a right relationship with you. And then Lord, you want to use us and to, to make your message of hope and salvation through us. And so Lord, would you do that this week? Would you help us, Lord? to share our story, to share your grace. Ultimately, all we're doing is pointing to you, pointing to Jesus, his death and his resurrection. Lord, and may that give us the confidence that we aren't sharing about ourselves, we're sharing about how you've worked through us. And Lord, would you use us in a powerful and mighty way for your glory? Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, would you stand as we close on our benediction today? After, uh, after the benediction, if you would like prayer for anything, yes, we would like to practice this priesthood thing. We would like to practice intervening to God on your behalf, or you want to intervene for somebody else that you know is hurting and lost. We'd love to pray with you. I'll be up here. There will be pastors and elders. We'd love to pray with you. But as you go out into this world, this day and this week, may the God of infinite power empower us to live by the Spirit, to be his representatives as we shine the light and love of Jesus. Go in peace. Amen.